So who can see me? Let me make sure everybody can see me before we continue on this crazy trek tonight. Okay, everybody can see. Now, there's another issue happening, and that is it's not broadcasting on Facebook because Facebook, the communists there, are denying StreamYard access. So I'm going to have to be contacting StreamYard about this because, you know, we pay a monthly fee to StreamYard to have this. This isn't free. So StreamYard should have worked these things out with Facebook a long time ago. So we're having another issue um, with that. What we may start doing, if you don't have the Ark of Grace app, please go to your app store and get it because we may start broadcasting live from the app and then putting it up on YouTube and Facebook after the fact. Okay, so please, if you can get the app, get it because we may start doing that. We also put them up on Rumble, uh, but this is what we may have to do only because of what is going on. So I just wanted to explain to everybody what's going on and uh, that we may have to switch this around a little bit. So just please, if you can, go get it. And uh, let me pray because it's been a heck of an evening already. And then I'm going to make an announcement. Um let me text Andre and tell him something so he can get it up on the screen. Actually, no, I'm going to do this live. So there's something I want to show you. And in order for Andre to get it up on the screen, I have to send it to him. So what I'm going to do is just do this right now. I want to show you this. So before I pray, I'm going to make sure we have it ready to go. And I'm going to send it to Andre. Okay. This is the fun part about having Andre around is this. Oh, perfect. Okay. Now, it's going to look different on my phone than it does on a computer. But. Okay. I'm going to send it to Andre and what he can put it up while I'm while I'm praying here, because I want to show you, I want to give you a visual for this. Okay, Andre, I sent it to you. <laughs> that's the fun part of this. Okay, so I'm going to pray. Hello to all our moderators and everybody that's coming on. We are back from California now, as you can see. Um, I'll explain a little bit too. It takes me um, a little bit longer to come on after a trip, because you have to remember that it, it is a little more of an undertaking to take Chris with me. And when we come home, decompressing him as well, like he hasn't been feeling so great today. So please pray for him. So that's why sometimes you see me, it's a little more staggered me getting back on, okay, after uh, a trip like that. So let me just pray. And then we'll talk about some things. So Father God, in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Lord, we come before you. We praise you, Father God, and we praise you, Lord, in all circumstances, and we praise you that you are God, Father, and that you order our steps, because the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Father, we come before you asking you to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, acknowledging what your son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, did on the cross as you sent your son, Father God, you sent your first fruits to the earth in the form of a man at Calvary and purchased us back to you, Lord. We honor that before you this day. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your presence and the presence of the Holy Spirit fills the atmosphere, Father God, of this house and this office. Father God, that it fills the broadcast, that it leads and guides, Father God, that you lead and guide us in all wisdom, counsel, might, power, and reverential fear of the Lord. Father, by the living God, may only the truth come forth, Lord. Father, take all the glory for yourself. You are the potter, we are the clay, and you are the author and finisher of our faith. We were created to glorify you, Father God. So take all the glory for yourself, Lord. Lead us and guide us, Father God. In Jesus' name, we praise you. Amen and amen. Okay. Okay. Now, what I sent to Andre. Andre, 
what I sent you um, from the other line, I sent you a poster for Liftable TV. Thank you. Now, this is this is a big announcement. So I want to thank Lloyd Brown and his lovely wife, Miss Mary Beth Brown, the CEO of Liftable Media. They have come up with this amazing platform called Liftable TV. So if you go to Liftable, L-I-F-T-A-B-L-E dot TV forward slash Ark of Grace, you're going to see me and Noble, okay? And it is a new platform for believers. They have also things like... Um, they have different ministries. They have cooking shows. They have lifestyle shows, and they're all hosted by believers. And so it's a it's a wonderful platform. And we're going to be doing special special content for them as well. They do have a deal where you can start watching for free, and they have a very low membership fee. I think it's seven ninety nine a month. Um, so basically, this is something new that we're doing, and. We praise the Lord for it. We're going to be doing special content uh, for Liftable TV as well. This is also something that's wonderful in case other platforms give an issue. We will have the app and we will have Liftable TV. So that's why we're doing it. Yeah, Noble is joining me in this picture. When you go on the landing page, you will see this picture of me and Noble. And so you can um, you can go from there. So we just wanted to announce that. And we praise the Lord for it. We're going to be putting it in the description of the videos as well. Now, also, we have two video clips we want to show you that Andre is going to get up. Um, I don't know what order Andre loaded them in. I don't think it matters. But the video footage that was taken while I was with my big brother Dave and his wonderful family uh, and our friends in anaheim for the reawaken america tour and also we did the prayer and baptisms on san clemente beach which was incredible so we have some short okay praise the lord so that was uh from the re i could tell I, I will tell you this so there was a lot of prayer and praising the lord that was going on there there were speakers praying with each other. Uh, Pastor Ber Gershon prayed with me and my husband, Chris. Um, there was a lot of praise going on. And we, there were, Pastor Phil had praise music and uh, Sean Foyt was there. And there was a time of just praising and worshiping the Lord. And so there was quite a bit of that that was going on there. There were, Pastor Phil not only did an altar call, Floyd Brown, the, who I was talking to you about, he did an altar call to uh, praise the Lord. And so it was, you know, it was something else. Let me just say that there's a lot of people there that truly, truly love the Lord and want to serve him and are being called to do some of these things right now. So we just wanted to share those things with you. Praise the Lord. And uh, next is going to be Grand Rapids, Michigan. So we are going to be there August 19th, 20th, and 21st. We will be there uh, with Dave Scarlett and his glory ministries as well. We're, I think we're doing the green room again. So praise the Lord for that. And uh, we're looking very forward to it. And I, a quick recap on California. I have to tell you, we went with the most incredible people. I have to tell you that my big brother, Dave, his wonderful wife, Christine, his amazing mom, Deb, Jamie and Elisa. Elisa is the COO of his glory. You saw Jamie helping with the baptisms, her hysterical Italian husband, um, friends that we already had out there as well. I'm trying to think who else we went with. Creed was there, who's like my little adopted nephew. We played each other in basketball. We did get footage. If I can put it up, I will. We played one-on-one. -on -one. It was hilarious. And so we also had our amazing friends out there that we saw. Carol, Elsa, John, Christy, Kim, and Tom. You know, all these people, Chris and his amazing wife. Um, and so it just, it was an amazing time. 
And these people are amazing. And I have to say what I appreciate the most is that they are so good with Chris. These people are so patient and amazing with Chris. And Jamie took Chris in the ocean so Chris could go swimming in the ocean. So it was something a lot of fun for me to watch. Um, and it was something that was very special. We had a wonderful time. We laughed a lot. And we did a lot, praise the Lord, to bring glory to the name of the Lord. And to watch, you know, as we were praying over people in San Clemente, to watch people coming up to my husband, Chris, to have him pray for them. I love that even more. So that was something that's amazing, too. That's something that is amazing, too. We will see what others say to what's going on. Uh, but I can tell you, I was at the conference. Dave was there. Um, others were there. And there were multiple altar calls. There was praising the Lord. Um, you have spirit-filled believers like Dr. Bartlett, who's become a personal friend of ours. And, and our doctors, Dr. Mark and Michelle Sherwood, who were there, all speaking about the Lord from the standpoint of their, you know, where the Lord has placed them, you know, their doctors and their doctors in different fields and where in ministry. Um, oh, oh, there were two Chris's, Chris, my husband, and then there was also um, Chris Burgard and his lovely wife there as well. Friends, you know, that we have made. And so basically, sorry, I didn't clarify for that, but it was... Um, Pastor Phil loves the Lord. Let me tell you something. It was hosted at Influence Church in Anaheim. Pastor Phil loves the Lord. He loves the Lord. And so it was just, they were so gracious to us. And it was just an amazing time. So that's the quick recap of that. I'm trying to think of, there were so many funny things that happened in California uh, while we were there that were just, you know, as I think of them on future broadcasts, I'll talk about them. Okay, now that we, oh, hey, what, how is Robert Kennedy? Teresa Day is asking, I have to tell you, very respectful, very knowledgeable, and he, he wrote a book that has to do with Fauci, and um, I found him to be, you know, I found him, it, it was like my first time meeting him, and I was pleasantly surprised, let's put it that way. Yes, we went to In-N-Out Burger. So I'm answering some of your questions quick. We went to In-N-Out Burger. I tried it for the first time because I'm not the biggest meat eater. You know, I have an animal sanctuary, so I'm not the biggest meat eater. Uh, my husband, Chris, has an affinity for chocolate milkshakes. So we had to get him one of those. Creed wanted a Dave and Christine's son, wanted an In-N-Out Burger t-shirt. So we got him one. We took him on the run with us to get everybody <laughs> In-N-Out Burger. And so... It, it was like quite a sight because, you know, you walk in and you feel like you've gone back to the 1950s almost and their food is delicious. So that was uh, the first night. Actually, we had in and out burger the first night. Dr. Cordy Williams, his wife and his two little boys came and joined us for dinner because we were in San Clemente half the time. OK, at the beach house. Did I make garlic bread? I'll be getting to that because me and Elisa's husband, Jamie, who's also Italian, cooked more than one night. We actually happened to do it at a get together. We had at somebody else's house and uh, they needed help and we jumped in. <laughs> we cooked. But night two, no, it was night three at the beach house. We went. Now, let me tell you something. Two Italians in a California grocery store, like two bulls in a China shop. We did do some filming in the grocery store because it was hilarious what was going on. Christine is an eyewitness. She was with us. Elisa, I think, was with us for one of the runs also. Eyewitnesses to all of this. And so we bought, you know, when two Italians say they're going to the grocery store for some things, you come back with two carts full. And we came back with two carts full of stuff and we cooked. And yes, I made garlic bread. We made uh steaks and barbecue chicken that was jamie's department we made potato salad and i made fried onion strings because it was a special occasion because you know that's not really a dr sherwood approved item so we did cook and we had a blast doing it and it was great 
So praise the Lord, you know, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We saw, I mean, many of the speakers we ran into there or we saw them or we saw them from a distance. So we saw, you know what I mean? Everyone's walking around there. So there was many uh, amazing people that were there and we thoroughly enjoyed to see them all. Uh, and it was just an amazing time. You know, it was just praise God. It little dip, time change is difficult. My first time in California. So time change was a little, you know what I mean? For me, that was something new. Chris was used to it because his parents lived in California for 10 years when his father was an engineer for IBM. So Chris used to go back and forth to California all the time. So this is nothing new for him. Me, a little different. Took a little bit of adjusting, but it is beautiful. And I'll tell you something interesting. Far less oppressive in the atmosphere than in New York State. I know that's going to sound shocking to some of you, but in the atmosphere, because I'm sensitive to what's in the atmosphere, spiritually, less oppressive where we were in the atmosphere than in New York. I know everybody's going, when are you coming to my state? When are you going to my state? Well, email Clay Clark. <laughs> Bombard his email, you know, <laughs> because it depends on uh, who is willing to host it. You know, as Chet is so agreeing in the background. So anyway, that's that. And um, glad to, you know, be back and be back on. So I'm going to try to do some of this teaching tonight. Because we've already gone 24 minutes just discussing this. Um, but it was, uh, we'll see if we can post some pictures too. But really amazing first experience for my first time there so that that's what i'll say and prayerfully we're gonna we're, we're gonna go back we're gonna go back at some point uh and yeah so that's it on the california front <laughs> wally is lit can i just show you wally hold on wally what are you doing on the desk? My wires were chewed, by the way. This is why we were having a hard time, too. I had to get another mouse from downstairs because the wire was chewed. By who, Wally? Who chewed the wire? Do you know nothing? He's like, I know nothing. So there's Wally. <laughs> and prayerfully stays over there. Now, now that we've gotten through all of that, all of California and the wonderful footage that we took, uh, we're going to get to this now. Now, this is going to be something, Wally does look guilty. He does look guilty. Uh, I think Wally did it. He, he's acting like he knows nothing right now. I really think Wally did it. Now, this is interesting what I'm going to get into now, because now this is just scratching the surface. So let me just say, yes, Wally is in trouble. This is just scratching the surface, what I'm going to talk about. Okay. So I'm trying to, so bear with me because I'm, I, we, we have the webcam and the microphone on the laptop and I'm looking at my notes on the computer, okay? So we're going to try to get these notes up and close, you know, real close and personal here so I can talk about this with you. But what we're going to talk about is now this is going to be looking at things in a way you've never looked at it before. And praise God, with the help of Andre and Annie and Jules, I was able to find my notes because we had to do a hard reset on the computer. And I, my notes got lost. So praise God, they were in the recoverable documents and we finally found them. And I had them on the phone and I was like, oh my gosh, I just lost 10 pages worth of notes. Praise the Lord. They help me. God is faithful. Oh, and it, oh, interesting side note for Grand Rapids, Michigan, before we start this. It's August 19th, 20th and 21st. Hi, Wally. He's going, hey, over there. So Grand Rapids is August 19th, 20th and 21st. The first day of the conference, August 19th, happens to be my birthday. So I found that kind of comical that we are going to be at the conference for my birthday, which is 
this is this is a first for me being at a conference on my birthday. I mean, I don't make a real big deal out of it, but I thought that was kind of a funny side note. Chet, I'm going to have to let him out of his cage, potentially, to do this teaching. Because while he's staring a hole through my head over here, Lord, I don't mean that literally in Jesus' name. And I got Chet yelling behind me, and I got Duchess on the floor right now. She's finally settled in. Remind me tomorrow. Oh, my gosh, it almost reached. There's Duchess right there. Okay. So what we're going to talk about is the mark of the beast. What is it? What it might be? There's a lot of things going around about this, and people have to look at scripture on this. Now, there's a very interesting theory. I shouldn't say theory, but there's something interesting the Lord showed me about the fig tree with this. Okay? So, I remember asking the Lord about this, because a lot of people write in about this. And the Lord said, if you want to know about the mark of the beast, you have to go to the book of Mark. The book of Mark. So, I did. And Mark chapter 11 and chapter 13 both cover the fig tree in association with the end times. Okay. Now, I'm going to read from Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14, and then verses 20 through 22. And then we're going to go to Mark chapter 13 and read. So this is what it says. Now, the next day... When they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now in the morning as they passed by, verse 20, they saw the fig dried up from the roots. And Peter remembered Remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Okay, if you go to Mark 13 now, the fig tree pops up again. We'll start at verse 28. Mark chapter 13. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour... No one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch now there's more to this than that but the lord was talking about the fig tree and the signs of the times wars and rumors of wars and he's saying just as you know when the fig tree gets its leaves and becomes tender you know summer is near why is he putting a fig tree in the middle of all this why does this fig tree keep popping up there's a reason for this now a little bit about the fig tree The fig tree has a regular pattern. The leaves appear, summer follows. When you see the leaves, you know summer is near. You know it's going to bear fruit. In the same way, when these signs, particularly the abomination of desolation, appear, the world can know that the triumphant return of Jesus is near at the door. Now, when you see the leaves, you know. What happens in summer? It gets hot, it gets humid, temperature rises, bugs come out in droves, trees and plants not only bloom but produce fruit. Now, the fig tree has these 
because the fig tree is compared throughout the word, including here to Israel. Okay. Figs are a shallow fibrous rooted species of tree. Interestingly enough, their wood is very weak. So I find it interesting that Israel keeps being compared to a fig tree and they have shallow fibrous roots. Um, and also the wood, the wood of the fig tree is weak and decays rapidly. What keep having kept having to, well, what kept happening to Israel throughout the Bible? They had shallow roots, so they constantly strayed from worshiping the Lord to worshiping pagan gods. And they were weak as a people. Their faith was weak as a people because they kept straying. So there's a reason the Lord keeps comparing them to a fig tree. Now you're going, what does this have to do with the mark of the beast? Well, I'm going to tell you. I'm trying to see what parts I can skip ahead to here to get to this. Oh, another interesting fact about the fig tree. The fruit generally ripens from August to October, which is the months of the Jewish high holy days. No, I don't think that's a coincidence either. Okay. They require full sun to ripen. Okay. And the size of the tree has to be reduced by pruning in order to cause it to bear more fruit. And it's kind of like how the Lord calls us. And we must grow into that call or assignment. So they need the sun to grow. Full sun, not just partial sun, full sun. And they reduce the size by, by basically pruning them. So they require full sun all day. So if Yeshua or Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, for us to mature, we need a close relationship and to be in the presence of the sun, Yeshua, the way the fig tree is always in the presence of the sun in order to properly grow. The fig tree has to be pruned constantly. We go through a lot of prunings in our lives. Why? So we grow more in the Lord. So we grow more in the call. So we produce the fruit we need to produce. There's a reason why God's people keep getting compared to a fig tree. Now. What is the fig tree and the mark of the beast? What do they have to do with each other? Because they have to do with each other, basically, in a really strange way. Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis, and we're going to jump to Revelation and the New Testament and come back. Genesis 3, 4 through 14. Then the serpent said that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew that they were naked and sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And then what happens? The Lord's walking in the garden. They hid themselves. And the Lord calls to Adam and says, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? By the way, there is a theory that this was some type of fig tree. Then the man said, the woman who you gave me. She made me, uh, she took of the tree and I ate. And then the Lord said to the woman, what you have done. And what did the woman say? It's the serpent who deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent that they would be cursed more than cattle because of what they had done. And they talk about enmity, putting enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is all in Genesis chapter three. Now. This, what happens in Genesis, follows the pattern of the Antichrist. The serpent deceives the, okay, so the serpent deceives man through his words. The serpent deceives man into taking something that the Lord warned them not the moment they believe the serpent over God, so the serpent becomes their God. Now, 
Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses nine through 12. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. What does it say in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 through 12? They believed the lie. They believed the lie. What did Adam and Eve do? They believed the lie. The lie of who? The lie of the serpent. So Adam and Eve were told not to take and partake in that particular tree, which may have been a fig tree. Do you find it interesting, Jesus talking about the fig tree, cursing it the first time, and then talking about its cycle of growth the second time in the Gospel of Mark to talk about the beginning of sorrows and the signs of the end times, okay? So the fig tree has been in the middle of the fall of man from the beginning. Man brought a curse upon themselves when they believed the lie and partook of something the Lord told them never to take. So the serpent told many lies to persuade Adam and Eve to do what he said, attempting to exalt himself above God. Attempting to get man to turn against God. What does this have to do with the mark of the beast? Revelation chapter 13, verses 5 through 6. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave. To receive a mark on their right hand or in their forehead. And that no one may buy or sell except who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Okay. Before we cover the mark, we have to understand the 666. Now. I'm going to take, teach you something very interesting here about this. If you translate in Revelation 13 about the mark or about the number of the beast, let the one with understanding reckon the meaning of the number of the beast for its number of a man is number is 666. The English word reckon comes from the Greek word for calculate or solve. So it's almost as if the text John Road is telling us, I'm going to give you a riddle. I'm going to give you a, an equation. You need to calculate and solve the number of the beast. You need to calculate and solve this equation. So what does the number 666 mean when you translate it out using the Greek alphabet? What does it mean? Well, Given the hatred of the Roman Empire at the time, and particularly its leader, Nero Caesar, who is considered to be especially evil, many historians have been looking for references of this in the biblical text, okay? Now, the biblical text wasn't written in a vacuum. It's a product of its time. It was written by Jewish people within a Jewish construct. Some of them even lived in Rome and were dealing with the issue, all the issues that came from Rome. So when you look at the original text, you'll see this passage, the letters, the or what John says is 666 is written in Hebrew. It's not written in Greek, which places a higher significance on numbers, meaning words and words, meaning numbers than the ancient Greeks did. So John, the, the revelation may have been written in Greek, but he wrote the, he wrote 666 in Hebrew. Now, if you translate the Hebrew spelling of 666, you actually spell out Neron, N-E-R-O-N, Kesar, K-E-S-A-R. 
the Hebrew spelling of Nero Caesar. You see, John was seeing so far into the future things he had never seen before. So what he was seeing, he had to somehow equate it to something of his time in order to be effective in transcribing what he saw. So seeing this blasphemous antichrist in the future, the one with the abomination of desolation, if he had to let those know at that moment how evil this antichrist is, what kind of person would they look for? He equates him to Nero Caesar, who was a very, very wicked individual who didn't think twice about engaging in horrific persecution. So John is saying, look, for a Nero Caesar. Here's the character profile. Here's the psychological profile. Look for a Nero Caesar type of person. This is what John was pointing to. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the mark of the fig tree. Now that we've talked about this 666 being written in Hebrew, in the middle of a Greek book of Revelations. Now that we know this information, now we're going to go back and we're going to get into this. Revelations chapter 13, verses 16 through 18. Again, he causes all both, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. What is the definition of a mark? An impression such as a scratch, a scar, or a stain made on something as a symbol used for identification or or indication of ownership. So a mark is visible. You can see it with your eyes. It's not under the skin. It's on the skin. You can see it on the skin. So the mark John saw was either people's right arms or their foreheads. He saw both because he writes about both. If he only saw the right arm, he would have only written about the right arm. But Revelation clearly states he saw it the forehead and the right arm. Okay? He saw it on both. And I'm going to say this, based on the text in Revelation, this inoculation or this shot is not the mark. Nobody is taking a shot in their forehead. And it is not leaving a visible mark for people to see. If it was under the skin, John would have said they put something in the skin or under the skin. He's not saying that. He can see it. It's a mark. What the shot or the inoculation is, it's a warm-up. It's a precursor. It's a dress rehearsal. It's a cobblestone in the path leading to Revelation 13. It's a piece of the puzzle. It's not the whole puzzle. Okay? So this is a test run for these crazies. Who want to see if they could get people to do things like this, to go out, to go to grocery stores, to go on planes or to go wherever. Okay, this is a dress rehearsal. It is a test run because John could see it. He said it's a mark. Now. Let's go back to Mark. Knowing a mark is a symbol used to identify. Okay. We're going to go back to the, we're going to go back to the mark now, knowing that what we know now, knowing what we know about Revelation 13, knowing that's the symbol used for identification. A couple of weeks ago, I asked the Lord about this. Maybe it was even a few weeks ago. And what I heard was the same thing I said earlier. To learn about the mark, you have to go to Mark, meaning the book of Mark. The, the Gospel of Mark, where both chapters 11 and 13, Jesus references the end times. In chapter 13, he references the book of Daniel and the abomination of desolation and the fig tree all together. He's referencing the fig tree with 
the end times with the abomination of desolation. And the Lord stopped me on the fig tree. Israel, in many different areas of scripture, is portrayed as a fig tree. Or God's people are portrayed as a fig tree. Where are they portrayed? Hosea chapter 9 verse 10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. What happens with the abomination of desolation? The image is set up in the temple and they become the thing they loved. The people who worship the beast become like the beast or the Antichrist. The people that worship the Antichrist become like him. Okay? It sounds like the parable for the Antichrist and those being separated to him and away from the Lord. Listen to Hosea 9, 10 again. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its first season, but they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. They became an abomination. The fig tree is mentioned with the abomination of desolation in Mark chapter 13, which ties to Hosea chapter 9 verse 10 when it comes to Israel now Jeremiah chapter 24 verses 4 through 8 again the word of the Lord came to me saying thus says the Lord the God of Israel like these good figs so while I will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah whom I have sent out of this place for their own good into the land of the Chaldeans for I will set my eyes on them for good and I will bring them back to this land I will build them and not pull them down and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Then I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return to me with their whole heart. Verse eight. And as the bad figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so bad. Surely thus says the Lord. So will I give up Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his princes, the residue of Jerusalem who remain in this land and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. I will deliver them to trouble into all the kingdoms of the earth for their harm to be a reproach and a byword, a taunt and a curse in all places where I shall drive them. And I will send the sword till they are consumed from the land that I gave them and their fathers. Again, the theme of the bad figs, the one who strayed from the Lord, the ones in Egypt, worshiping false gods, completely turning from the ways of the Lord. Sword similar to Mark chapter 13, verse 8. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. So the fig tree throughout scripture is associated with the people of God, and then whether they produce good fruit or bad fruit. And the fig tree is in Mark chapter 11 and 13 into Jeremiah 24. And Jesus associates the cycle of the fig tree, which has a 120 to 150 day cycle, with certain events happening, indicating signs of the beginning of sorrows in the end times. He equates this. Why does he equate the fig tree? Why does he keep mentioning the fig tree? So after this, the Lord takes me back to Genesis. Okay, perceived to be the Lord. Why? Because the Old Testament is the New Testament hidden, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. They go together. He takes me all the way back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, it's hinted out this could have been some type of fig tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. However, the Bible does not specify exactly what type of fruit it is okay genesis however figs are very prevalent in that part of the world genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 
Now, and, and that's where we go back to the serpent being more cunning, lying to Eve. The Lord said, don't touch this, don't partake of this. She partakes of it. Adam partakes of it. The serpent, they have partook of what the serpent told them to partake of. It causes a separation. But what happens from that? Here is the question that was posed to me as I was praying and pondering this. What is the first symbol or the first thing man placed on themselves as an indication they had rebelled, that they had partaken of what God didn't want them to, that they had believed the serpent? What was the first thing man put on themselves? A fig leaf. When they partook of what the serpent told them to do and they fell, the first thing they did was sew fig leaves together and cover themselves. The fig leaf was now evidence that they had rebelled because they didn't know to cover themselves before. So God seeing those fig leaves was evidence that they had eaten of that tree and knew they were naked. Okay? So the symbol or mark spoken of in Revelation 13 is the covering of the beast. It's the serpent, the Antichrist. It's the mark. Those who have it can buy and sell. It's the symbol that indicates, indicates man has rebelled against God or from God. And chosen to believe the serpent, the Antichrist, with all his lies and blasphemies, and believes those lies as truth and partake of it and cover themselves with that symbol. Okay? Cover themselves with that symbol. So if a fig leaf is the first thing man put on themselves when they rebelled, what if the mark is a universally recognized symbol from that part of the world that the Antichrist, hi Wally, comes from. That is visible on the skin. And what if that symbol has to do with a fig leaf? Because the fig leaf was the first symbol man had on them, the first thing when they fell. And they partook of what God told them not to partake when they partook of of it with the serpent. What if? What if it's a symbol? And don't you find it odd that the fig leaf is the first recognizable thing that man put on themselves when they fell god knew because they covered themselves in fig leaves they didn't know to cover themselves before he knew that was the indication they had partaken of what he told them not to partake that was the symbol of them being fallen was the fig leaf now it's just an idea it's just something to think about because it's going to be a symbol Or the number, or the, you see what I mean? What talks about book of Revelation? Because you have to be able to see it. You see, John had to be able to see this mark. They didn't know enough about science and shots. He knew nothing about this, John, when he's watching this. So if there was no symbol, if there was no mark, he would have never said there was a mark. They took something he could see. There was something put on them he could see. Another argument for this. Jesus talked about many antichrists coming before ultimately the one that has to do with the abomination of desolation. What happened in Nazi Germany? What did they do to the Jews? They put a mark on them. They put a mark. That was a number code that you could see. So if Jesus is saying many would come before, 
and would try to do similar things, but wouldn't be as horrific, although they were horrific, as the Antichrist with the abomination of desolation, they put a mark on the Jews that you could see that numerical tattoo, right? And the Nazis also marked themselves, and I believe they wore it on their right arm. Both were visible marks. Both were visible marks. So you even see throughout history, when other antichrists have come, you see the similarities of marks. You know what I mean? 